My name is Dr Lucy Hawkes. I'm a lecturer in physiological ecology at the University of Exeter and I study animal migration and I study birds, sharks and sea turtles. I really enjoy performing field research studying bar-headed geese because there's never a dull moment. It's really exciting and really, really interesting. Every year I'm able to travel to Mongolia and I live in a felted yurt. It's a type of a tent but made out of thick, thick wool. And I live in a tent with Mongolian people. And we go out and we find bar-headed geese who are usually swimming around on a lake and then we have to try to catch them. And it's really difficult to catch them. And it's almost like launching a military campaign. The geese are very very good at escaping from us so we've been trying lots of different ways to catch them and now we're quite good at it but it's taken us a long time i love to be able to travel there and to be able to meet local people and see how they live and really see the world from a different point of view the downside of traveling to mongolia is that their food is not my favorite they eat mainly just sheep the ground is usually frozen there's very little food around So Mongolians tend to eat every single last part of the sheep. So they eat all of the innards and the guts and all the bits that we don't tend to eat so much in the UK. That's probably the worst part of the fieldwork for me. A bar-headed goose is a really attractive goose. It's about two kilos in weight. That's a good armful of goose. It's probably about 50 centimetres long. It's a pale grey goose. It's got a bright orange beak and bright orange legs, and it's got two really attractive black bars just behind its eyes. When a bar-headed goose flies to high altitude, it needs to take a load of kit with it, a little bit like a human mountaineer. If you're a human mountaineer, you wouldn't attempt to climb Mount Everest without your boots and your ice axe and your down suit. And a bar-headed goose has to take a load of really awesome gear with it as well. Bar-headed geese live in Asia, and they live both at low latitude in India, but also at high latitude up on the Tibetan Plateau, which is otherwise known as the roof of the world. So bar-headed geese in the wild can be found as far north as Russia, as far east as China and the China Sea. They go all the way down into India, and at their furthest west you can get them in Kyrgyzstan. That's almost about as far as Turkey, so they almost enter into Europe. Bar-headed geese tend to live in tundra. That is just rolling grassy plains with no trees because there's low temperatures and very short growing seasons for plants. In India, bar-headed geese like to live in marshes and also in rice paddy fields. So they tend to interact in areas where humans are there too. It seems like an incredible migration that bar-headed geese make, but there's a really good reason for it. They tend to spend the winter in India, and in India there's loads of food around, really, really nice rice paddy fields they can feed in and salt marshes where they can eat aquatic plants. But India also has a lot of predators, and when bar-headed geese breed, their little goslings aren't able to fly for a few weeks. And if bar-headed geese had their goslings in India, the chances are they'd get eaten by a fox or a dog. So if they travel to much higher latitudes, there are fewer predators around, and the goslings should survive. Now, you might think, well, why not just stay up north then? Why come south at all? Well, in Mongolia and China, where bar-headed geese breed, in the winter it becomes extremely cold and the ground is completely frozen. Not only would the cold temperatures probably kill the bar-headed geese and their goslings, but there's no food available there either. For the last five years, I've been tracking wild bar-headed geese, along with a team of researchers from the UK, Canada, and Australia, and the USA. And we have a tiny little device that we strap onto the back of the goose, a little bit like a backpack. And everywhere that the goose moves, we have a message sent to us over the internet that shows us where the animal is. And we tracked 91 geese like this all together. We tracked them from Mongolia, from China, and also from India. And these transmitters tell us where the bird is, but they also tell us how high they went. And what we found is that bar-headed geese in the wild fly as high as 7,290 metres above sea level. Mount Everest is at 8,848 metres, so that's really, really high. But what we also found was that not that many geese flew that high. In fact, 95% of all the locations we got came from below 5,800 metres, which is about the same as Everest Base Camp. So bar-headed geese aren't necessarily flying over the summits of the world's highest mountains if they don't have to. 
In fact, we showed that if a valley is available, a bar-headed goose will take it rather than flying over the top of a mountain. So our wild tracking data has been able to show that bar-headed geese aren't quite as stupid as they look. Bar-headed geese have a slightly larger wingspan. Because they've got slightly larger wingspan, that means they've got a higher wing area compared to the size of their body. If you've ever checked onto a budget airline, you've probably found that they charge you extra to take a suitcase. And that's because carrying more weight on a plane means they have to use more fuel. So if a bar-headed goose has bigger wings but a smaller size body, then it actually will use less fuel to travel, a little bit like some of those budget airlines. mitochondria are the powerhouses in your body. They're used to generate all the energy that we need to function. And bar-headed geese have moved their mitochondria right to the edge of the cell membrane. And that's because mitochondria need oxygen to function. So by moving the mitochondria as close as possible to where the oxygen comes across into the cell, they can maximise efficiency. And they do that better than any other species of goose does. Bar-headed geese can increase the capacity that they can breathe. So they don't actually breathe a little bit quicker, but they breathe much more deeply. So they can actually get seven times more air into their lungs per minute when they're exercising at high altitude as they do when they're resting. And that's more than any other goose can do, about twice as much as any other goose can manage. So our heart tends to stay the same size for all of our adult life, but birds can change the size of their heart over the course of a season. So when they're ready to migrate, when they know they have to do lots of exercise, they can actually stimulate their heart to start to grow a little bit bigger in comparison to the rest of the size of their body. And when they finish migrating, the heart will shrink back again to the size that it was before. That's quite awesome because humans couldn't do anything like that. Bar-headed geese have a substitution in their haemoglobin. That's the compound that carries oxygen in your blood. And the substitution is in an amino acid. And what it means is that bar-headed goose's haemoglobin takes up oxygen much more readily and much more quickly than, than it does in, say, for example, humans or other birds that don't live at high altitude. Bar-headed goose have a lot more blood being supplied to their flight muscles and to their heart than other species. So they have lots more capillaries in their flight muscle, and those capillaries are more evenly spaced out so that the oxygen is distributed really, really fairly. Bar-headed geese might have one more trick up their sleeve to manage to fly at extreme high altitude, and this is related to how much they can load oxygen into their blood. If you have a look at this graph, it shows how we can load oxygen into our blood. On the x-axis is the partial pressure of oxygen. That's how much oxygen is available in the atmosphere for us to use. On the y-axis is how much of the haemoglobin is saturated with oxygen. And what you can see is that when there isn't very much oxygen around, haemoglobin isn't saturated. And when there's lots of oxygen around, haemoglobin can be fully saturated. You've got a full tank of petrol with which to operate. But what you can see is that the shape of this relationship isn't a straight line, and that's because of the shape of the haemoglobin molecule. It's made up of four subunits, and each time a subunit grabs onto a molecule of oxygen, it changes the shape of the molecule very slightly and makes it easier for the next one to join. And in total, it will join four molecules of oxygen. So the shape of this curve is about an S. Well, what happens to the blood is that when it's made a little bit colder, all of this S moves to the left. If you have a look at the graph, that means that for a given amount of oxygen in the atmosphere, bar-headed geese can actually saturate their blood even more with oxygen. So if you're a bar-headed goose, if you can make your blood cold, you can get more oxygen out of the atmosphere than you could if your blood was warm. Well, when bar-headed geese are flying at high altitude, the air is really cold. It can be down to about minus 20 degrees Celsius. So the blood in their lungs will be very cold, which means it can take up oxygen much more readily than normal. By the time the blood moves around into the flight muscles and the bird's working really, really hard, it's really, really hot there and the blood gets hot, which means that it gets rid of oxygen much more quickly, so it delivers it to the flight muscles really efficiently. And this is a really strange little trick that we're actually going to collect some more information in the wild to try to see if it really happens. <laughs>